What I'm going to cover today is a little bit of the EPD related information uh, as we've applied it to the 300 day grazing demonstration herd and then uh, kind of complement that with what Dr. Hubble or uh, Don Hubble was uh, talking about in terms of the bulls that they've used here at the station within their herds uh, since about 2008. Uh, the lighting uh, here isn't going to complement some of these images I'm going to show, but this was our calf crop out of the 300 day grazing herd uh, last May, uh, the day after fence line weaning. And so you can take a look at that calf crop. And we've got some black calves, red calves, uh, Charlet cross calves. Um, th these calves, as I think ab about uh, those calves at that point of weaning, uh, we all realize the importance of that calf in terms of the overall profitability of our operation when it comes to generating income. Uh, in terms of profitability, we've got the income side and the expense side. And our economists tell us that uh, you know, a, a large part of profitability uh, encompasses the, uh, the cost of production. But on the other side of, of that, we have to have income and to increase income is generally going to come in uh, two major forms, and we talk about it in terms of pounds weaned per cow exposed. And so if you think about that, there's two major important factors going on at play. One, uh, selling more weight will generate uh, more income per calf, even though the price per pound is a little bit lower. Uh, we generally will get more, uh, more dollars uh, per calf weaned if they weigh heavier. And then the cow exposed aspect. Uh, reproduction is very important. Um, we got to make sure that we're managing our cows to where we are having that 90% uh, calf crop with our mature cow herd. So as I think of the balance between those in terms of how we're managing our cow herd, I think what fits in the middle of that is our sire selection, especially as we're keeping replacement heifers. Um, our sire selection can uh, dictate reproduction in, in terms of calving ease. It can uh, dictate the pounds weaned per cow exposed on the weaning weight side uh, as it relates to the uh, weaning weight of those calves. And on the maternal side, uh, the amount of additional weight that we get on calves associated with milking ability of the cow. But with that, we also have to recognize that um, as we select for things like weaning weight and uh, milk production, we might be selecting for bigger females with a greater maintenance requirement. And so if our cows get too big and we get too much milk production in our cow herd, we could ultimately uh, reduce our pregnancy rates, which would lower our pounds weaning per cow exposed. And so sire selection is very important in terms of balancing uh, the total pounds weaned in our cow herd operation. And we can complement this decision uh, by selecting um, sires that's going to help uh, with the uh, frame size of our calves. The market really likes the medium and large frame cattle, number one muscle. And the um, cell barn survey that Dr. Troxel uh, had, had implemented uh, over several years, a five year spans, over three years, five years apart, black, black, white face, yellow, yellow, white face, uh, all of those uh, received above average price. And so we can think about the coat color of our calves and the sire uh, that we, or sire breed that we might choose to uh, run on our cow herd to produce a more marketable coat color. And then uh, one thing is that uh, no evidence of Brahmin influence. It doesn't mean that we can't have Brahmin influence in our cow herd, but in our calf crop, we would like to be able to minimize Brahmin influence of those calves going to market. And then just management uh, with castrating and dehorning uh, those, those calves. So with our 300 day grazing herd, uh, this just kind of reflects our winning weights from 2009 through 2015. That red line uh, really represents uh, our target. We would like to have you know, at least a 500 pound weaning weight out of our cow herd when we looked at setting goals for that cow herd. Um, year after year, the, the solid black line in the middle of all these boxes represents the median weight, uh, the weight in the middle for the, both the male and female calves. And you can see that, that across time, our, our best three years was about 2011, 12, and 13. Uh, this first year, our calf crop was predominantly balancer calves. From 2010 through 2014, those are going to be predominantly Hereford calves. And then this uh, past year, the calves that we just uh, completed cow herd performance testing on, uh, those are uh, some Hereford calves, and uh, some of those are going to be Brangus calves. And I'll talk about our breeding program uh, here shortly as it related to breeding, breeding cows in 2013-14 for the 2014 fall calving season. 
as I looked at these weights, I'm thinking, well, you know, we've got a, a big group of Herefords here. Uh, we've got uh, some Brangus cattle here and some uh, Balancer calves here. Um, what could be some of the underlying differences in weaning weights of these calves? Part of that could be the fact that not all the same sires were used every year. Uh, maybe through 2010 and 2013, our, our sires may have been a little bit above average during this time. It could have been environmentally related. As I looked at the growing degree days and the rainfall, uh, during the entire uh, period of September through the point of collecting this data, uh, there was a couple of years where uh, we tended to have uh, fewer growing degree days. Uh, one year happened to be 2011 and the other one happened to be last year, 2014. Y'all can remember how bad the, the March was of last year and then the cold, wet winter. Um, maintenance requirements were up on our cows during that time. And then we had uh, probably the best year was right around uh, this time frame here. And so really there's no clear pattern of the relationship of those weaning weights with, uh, with the weather patterns that, that we'd observed over time. And part of that uh, difference in weaning weight maybe is uh, related to the body condition of our cows. As I mentioned earlier, as we select cows to go into our cow herd, if, if they're bigger, if they're producing more milk, um, and we are not managing the forage base to complement that greater level of production, we could ultimately cause cows to be, um, be given up too much body condition prior to uh, breeding during that period of early lactation, especially if they don't go into breeding season in good body condition, and ultimately uh, affect uh, uh, weaning weights of, of our calves. And so if we look at the bars here, the, the white up here would represent body condition score eight cows. Uh, the brown would be the body condition score 7. Uh, the darker brown would be body condition score 6. Uh, the light green, body condition score 5. And then the uh, dark green would be body condition score 4. And so you can probably tell that, you know, during this period where we had better weaning weights, uh, we had cows in better body condition. And so there may be some nutritional things that are going on that are influencing body condition or influencing calf weaning weights at that time. Uh, but it could be... Um, uh, sire uh, genetics as well. But overall, um, this is at weaning time, our cows tend to be in, in good to very good body condition. Um, the majority of our cows at the point of weaning are always in at least a body condition score five. Uh, we'll have a few cows come through that are body condition score four. And these are cows that are all, you know, pretty much all bred back. And so uh, nutritionally, I, I think uh, Dr. Jennings has done a really good job of, of taking cow, care of the cow herd. Um, so as I, I look at the, the pasture situation and how he's managing the cow herd, the body condition score of the, of the calves at weaning time, uh, one aspect of, of increasing weaning weights uh, could be related to the size of the cow. Uh, you, you know, on an individual animal basis, uh, one half of that genetic potential is from the sire and then the other half is coming from the cow. And really at weaning time, there may be a little bit more influence from the cow as it's associated with her milking ability. Um, a lot of the post-weaning weight gain is going to be heavily influenced by sire, but that pre-weaning uh, milk production can have a, a lot of influence there. And so as I look at the size of our cows, I think, well, maybe, uh, maybe there's opportunity uh, to, to allow the cows to maybe get a little bit bigger in this, in this uh, breeding program. Or maybe as I select bulls uh, to, to breed females and I'm keeping replacements, do I have to worry about cow size yet? Um, if this median bar was up here around uh, 1,250, maybe 1,300 pounds, I might be a little bit worried about cow size. But right now, our mature cows, and if you're uh, wondering about the difference here, um, damn age, cows really don't hit their full mature weight until they're about age four. And so as I look at those cows from age four plus, um, our median mature cow size is right around 1,050 uh, to a little less than 1,100 pounds. Uh, in a body condition score of five at weaning. And so we don't have really big cows, big heavy cows out there. And so maybe part of uh, increasing weaning weights uh, may come in the fashion of letting my cows get a little bit bigger. Um, if, like I said earlier, if, if I was dealing with 1,300 pound cows, I'd probably be worried about my cows getting too big and the impact that that would have on the carrying capacity uh, of the land allocated to the 300 day grazing demonstration. 
So, so all of that makes me think about sire selection. What type of sires are we going to use? What are we going to look for in those sires? Uh, Don, I, I visited with him last summer, and uh, like he had mentioned, we, he had uh, many years worth of data of individual sires run with cow groups. And uh, the question was, uh, when we select these sires based on their EPDs, what we select for, are we really going to get what, we're, what we expect? And so um, if I gave you the raw data and put that up here, uh, like I sent Don, you would scratch your head and wonder what in the world is, is going on with uh, EPDs and the effect that uh, we see uh, out of our calf crop for birth weight and weaning weight. Um, here on the experiment station, we have many studies going on. There's a lot of environmental influences on weaning weight. And so there's a lot of variation, uh, even within a breed in terms of what we're measuring with uh, growth rate responses for any individual sire. Uh, the other challenge that we, we come into is that we don't have all of the sires that Don's used reflected in, in every year of production. Uh, the, the first few years, uh, Don was running balancer sires, uh, then following the, the balancer sires, uh, and with the balancer there was a couple of Gelvy mixed in there, uh, but then following that there was a time period uh, with some Charlay, and then following that time period with some Angus and Hereford. And, and so some of the more recent breeding is going to be related to some Hereford bulls that Don had purchased. And so how do we, how do we account for all of these different sires that aren't used uh, within the same year to, to gather some information of if I select a, a sire that is uh, exhibiting a heavier birth weight EPD, will I get heavier birth weights uh, and lower birth weight EPD, lower birth weights? And so uh, really what I had to do there was just kind of rank those sires within uh, the breed and the season that they were, they were used. And so by ranking the, the calves and the sire within breed and season, we can see some very clear relationships. That those sires that had uh, greater EPDs for birth weight or greater EPDs for weaning weight produced calves with greater birth weights or greater weaning weights. And then uh, on the opposite side of the scale, those sires that had the lesser EPDs for birth weight and lesser EPDs for weaning weight produced lighter calves at birth, they produced lighter calves at weaning. And each of these points represents the, the average uh, ranking of those sires. And so you can see about 31 sires or points that went into that analysis. So the answer is yes. Will we get what we want? Uh, part of the challenge we have with EPDs is it, it may not be as specific as the EPD we're using because most of the time uh, we're going to be using an unproven sire. Uh, and that means that we're buying a, a young bull and we're using interim EPDs to gauge what we think that that bull is going to do in terms of moving our cow herd toward greater weaning weights, greater milk production, greater carcass traits, uh, whatever our production goals are attributed to the sire that we chose. For 2013, our breeding season then, uh, uh, Dr. Troxell and, and Brett Barham many years ago set out and said, hey, let's, uh, let's look at maybe bringing in some Brangus influence uh, and utilize that to maybe uh, improve some uh, resilience against the fescue in, in that 300-day grazing program, maybe improve the milk production of our cow herd. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've got, we've got some room for increasing body weights in our cow herd, uh, but then we may also have some room to increase milk production in that cow herd. And so as we uh, look here, uh, this here is, are the EPDs. Uh, when we went to select an AI sire, uh, we wanted to see how well that AI sire would match up to the Hereford sires that we had been using in the past. And so what we uh, set out to accomplish was we wanted a bring a sire that wasn't going to be low birth weight, low weaning weight, and give up the weaning weight performance that we've had out of Hereford. And so uh, we set that as a goal to make sure we had enough uh, weaning weight in our calves when we switched over to the Brangus. And so how did we do that? Well, we took the Hereford sires and the EPDs. At any point in time, you could go to a breed association, even if that bull's eight years old, uh, like with Don's data, I could go in and get current EPDs for that sire uh, based on uh, his pedigree. And so uh, the Hereford bulls that we'd historically used, I went into the Hereford Breed Association, pulled out the EPDs using the registration numbers, 
And then I uh, used the hombre uh, bull, was the one we ultimately chose, um, as a comparison to those Hereford sires that we'd used in the past. And so you see numbers here, birth weight EPDs, weaning weights, yearling weights, and milk. Um, as we compare those two, we see 3.6, 2.0, 52, and 35. Well, that's our first error. We can't compare Hereford EPDs to Hombre EPDs uh, because uh, those are generated under different circumstances and they have different base years for generating these numbers. Uh, they're not generated across breeds. Uh, but some researchers, what they have done is they've uh, went in uh, using certain breeds in similar environments and uh, have given us a cross-breed EPD adjustments. I don't have the adjustment numbers here because they can change from time to time as breeds change their base year, uh, but they are published every year. And so uh, here within the, you know, if they're not already out, here with probably in another month or two, there'll be a crossbreed EPDs uh, published for 2015. Uh, so after uh, we applied the crossbreed EPD adjustments, now we can do a better job of comparing, or hopefully comparing, the Hereford to, to the Hombre Brangus sire uh, as a uh, apples to apples comparison. And so after the adjustment to the EPDs, uh, when we start comparing these sires, the birth weight EPD adjusted um, is uh, virtually the same, 6.3 versus 6.5. The weaning weight EPD, uh, very similar, 49 versus 48. The yearling weight EPD, 67 versus 67. So by switching to the Hombre sire from the Hereford sires, um, I really you know, was hoping that we wouldn't change birth weight, weaning weight, or yearling weight uh, too much, that, that things would play out as they've done in the past. Uh, one thing that we were hoping to get out of the Brangus sire was greater milk production. And you can see the difference in the milking ability of the Hombre versus the Hereford. Um, and this translates into production of their daughters. And so hopefully what we'll see is by keeping replacement heifers out of the hombre sire that we will have out of those heifers about a 17 pound advantage in weaning weight um, as opposed to what we'd have tr traditionally gotten if we'd have kept the Hereford uh, he crossbred heifers as replacements. And so that was one of our objectives there with the Brangus sire. The other one was the homozygous black. And so if you had noticed, we'd been running a Hereford bull on some cows that were out of, out of balancer. They're carrying some red genes. And so we had that mixed calf crops of blacks and reds. And so hopefully by switching over to a homozygous black that uh, will produce a, a greater percentage of a black calf crop for market. Uh, back in uh, earlier this, uh, this month, uh, the uh, weaning weights of the Hereford versus the Hombre sires. Uh, if you can look at those median values, that dark black bar in the middle, uh, we could see that the weaning weights were very similar. As, uh, as we look at uh, the distribution, if these two boxes are overlapping considerably, that means that statistically uh, there's really no difference in those weaning weights. Uh, one advantage that the Hombre uh, calves had in terms of actual weaning weight was those calves were a little bit older. Uh, one disadvantage they had was we had more heifers in the hombre group, and so heifers are generally lighter at weaning. The advantage was, was at age, and so the 205-day adjusted weaning weight, that's the tool that we use in genetics to really try to segregate out uh, potential where we're removing age bias and gender bias uh, with uh, our comparisons of production. Now this past year, uh, instead of utilizing the hombre bull, we couldn't uh, acquire semen for the hombre bull, uh, so we selected the Braxton bull. And if we compare the uh, differences, since they're out of the same breed, now we can start to compare uh, directly the EPDs. And so here we're looking at um, just a 1.1 pound difference in birth weight, where the Braxton would expect maybe 1.1 pound heavier birth weights than what we would have had with the hombre. With the weaning weight, we're giving up maybe a little bit of weaning weight with the Braxton. Um, the Braxton bull has a, a really good amount of post-weaning growth potential and a little bit more milk production than that hombre bull. Uh, one thing to note as you look at EPDs is an accuracy. And uh, as I publish EPDs, I'll publish an accuracy. And so that tells you how much variation around any of these uh, produced values uh, that you, you might expect. And so uh, basically that's a plus or minus. And so the hombre, his birth weight, because he's fairly high in accuracy, 
is 2.2 pounds plus or minus 0.3 pounds. The Braxton bull is 3.3 plus or minus 0.7. And so we can see that once we account for this accuracy, uh, that uh, really we, we may not expect much difference in birth weight uh, of these two bulls, um, not much difference in weaning weight of these two bulls, and potentially maybe not much difference in yearling weight of the two bulls. And so uh, the, genetically, in terms of uh, progeny performance, they're very similar. <clears throat> so application of, of EPDs today, uh, man, that index keeps growing. Those charts, but before long, they're gonna have to publish them uh, on multiple pages uh, because there's so many numbers uh, that they're generating out of breed associations. And it can uh, make it a little bit mind-boggling to decide, well, what am I gonna select for? Uh, traditional EPDs, these have been around a long time. Uh, we can uh, utilize EPDs to improve calving ease. Uh, we do that by selecting lower birth weights. Uh, we can select for greater weaning weight, yearling weight. We can select for greater uh, weaning weights from heifers uh, with the milk EPD. Uh, we can select for disposition with docility. We can select for things like stayability. Will that heifer stay in the herd for five to six years because that's, gonna, that's how long it's gonna take before we start really making money from that female. We can select for carcass EPDs. Uh, many breed associations are providing today what they call index EPDs. And so instead of uh, trying to decipher calving ease, birth weight, and weaning weight, I might just look at that weaning index and use a one number to determine which bull ranks better than the other. Um, another growing area with EPDs is related to some efficiency related measures. Uh, some of those are gonna be associated with what they call residual average daily gain, uh, yearly dry matter intake measurements, mature weight and metabolizable energy. And I'll just kind of highlight some uh, areas of concern with these later on. So as in, in terms of application of EPDs in your cow herd, you have to use what's gonna benefit you. If you're, if, you're not, if you're not keeping calves all the way to the point that they're hung on the rail, then uh, why are we gonna pay for, more for a bull that has greater carcass traits? If our market is back here at weaning time, maybe that's the point that we have to stop with our EPD selection. Um, so what, what benefits your herd, and that means replacement females and marketing, what benefits your herd, and only use EPDs up to that point. Um, for example, if, if you're weaning calves, uh, but you're not keeping any replacement heifers, and you're weaning those about seven months of age, they're going to market at that point, maybe calving ease, birth weight, and weaning weight EPDs are as far as you want to go. Or maybe you can capitalize on a selection index that kind of sum, sums all of these together. Um, if you're keeping replacement heifers, you're probably going to want to start looking at some of the maternal characteristics of those sires. With the milk EPD, uh, maybe some of the mature size characteristics if you have really large cows. Um, something to consider with replacements. And then if you're keeping cattle all the way to a terminal market, uh, then you really need to focus on those carcass traits as well. So how are you selecting your bulls? I think as, it, as we think of EPDs, it's quite interesting as we look at a couple of sales in terms of what uh, producers were paying more or less for. Uh, this is some data out of um, the Panhandle area, the Panhandle Bull Test Program. One of our graduates is, is out there um, in that department. And uh, they basically had three different models with Angus bulls from the Panhandle Bull Test Program from 2008 to 2013. And so their first model was, set, was looking at the bull test performance only. And they uh, included things like average daily gain, um, they included the birth weight of the bulls, the final test weight of the bulls, and a couple of other growth characteristics. The second model they looked at was this model one, plus they threw in some of the production and maternal EPDs. And then the third model, they took model number one, model number two uh, parameters, and then they added in there the carcass EPDs. So they wanted to say, well, um, are producers looking at those carcass trade EPDs in their selection decision? Are they looking at performance-based EPDs in their selection decision? Or what are they really focusing on when they buy that bull? And so the, the characteristics of the bulls as it related to price was 
Firstly, average daily gain. It didn't matter which model, average daily gain was highly important. Bulls that grew faster were the bulls that buyers were willing to pay more for. Uh, the second one was birth weight of the bulls. They didn't want bulls that uh, were going to have heavy birth weights. We want good post winning gain, but we don't want heavy birth weights. And then final test weight of those bulls. We're willing to pay more money for bulls that are bigger and heavier. Um, as they looked at uh, model number two, calving ease was important, but we could say, well, that's already accounted for in, in uh, the birth weight of those bulls. And so when they put in the third model, calving rate fell out and ribeye area came into play. But ribeye area, we could say, is probably fairly correlated well with that final test weight. So ultimately, the big three was average daily gain, birth weight, and final test weight with very little influence of selecting based on APDs even though it's a really valuable tool that we can use to make selection decisions. Uh, here's a few cells, the 2012 Northeast Arkansas Angus cell, a couple of Hereford cells, one in Arkansas, another one in Texas, combined and then a Charlay cell in Texas. Uh, we kind of see some similar characteristics here. Uh, cell weight was important in the Angus cell. Um, age, which is going to be highly correlated with cell weight, uh, was important in the Hereford cells and the Charlay cell in Texas. Um, here what we found was that uh, we wanted older, more mature bulls that were ready to go into the breeding herd, but at those cells, if those bulls were too old, uh, they were maybe looked at in terms of uh, just kind of uh, uh, bulls that nobody else had wanted to buy off the farm. Um, if we look at EPDs, calving ease, very important, um, and birth weight. So we're, we're wanting bulls that are easy calving, uh, but uh, we also want some uh, bulls as we looked at uh, the things that factored into these models uh, that were going to produce uh, pretty good yearling weights. So age related to, to birth weights are very important, uh, or uh, yearling weights are very important to cell factors, and then um, bulls that we're not going to expect to have much calving difficulty. So in terms of application of EPDs, uh, one of the best tools I think that's out there is when the breed started giving us percentile breakdowns. So this is a way that we can not only look at how a bull compares to the average, uh, but we can look at where that bull fits regarding all bulls. And so the 50th percentile in a percentile breakdown would represent averages for the breed. So uh, for this particular sheet uh, and this breed weaning weights, the median EPD or average EPD is right around 49. Um, I could see that if I was able to buy a bull that had an EPD for weaning weight of 57, not only is that bull above average, but he's, he represents the top 20% of that breed. So he's very good relative to all of the others in that breed. And so the percentile breakdowns is a very useful tool when you start looking at genetic potential of sires. One of the things that I got concerned about is should, be, should we be over concerned with selecting for calving ease? Um, ultimately, if we select, put too much selection on calving ease, do we, do we end up selecting for lesser birth weights, which corresponds to lesser weaning weights, lower yearling weights, smaller replacement heifers, smaller replacement heifers mean smaller cows, and eventually are they going to end up creating more calving difficulty by selecting too, putting too much pressure on calving ease. Uh, so uh, Larry Cora, who, who used to be the, the director over Certified Angus Beef, he had put out a publication where he looked at the top 25% of Angus sires for um, carcass traits, in particular um, marbling and how they uh, fell into CAB, and then the bottom 25% of all the Angus sires. And when I saw that data, I, I sent uh, uh, Larry an email and said, could you take that data set and sort it for me and do it for uh, birth weight EPD and calving ease uh, direct and so he uh, responded back and sent me those numbers and I thought it was quite interesting that uh, maybe maybe we don't have to be too over concerned about selecting bulls for uh, low birth weights, uh, easier calving because as we looked at and this just really focuses on to the point of weaning that there's a high correlation between calving ease and birth weight. If we select for greater calving ease we're going to select for greater birth weight. But in terms of birth weight and its correlation to weaning weight and yearling weight, at least within the Angus breed, that correlation is pretty small. So that tells me that we could select for lesser birth weights, easier calving, but not give up too much with uh, weaning uh, weights and yearling weights. 
So we're talking about the top 25% versus bottom 25% of Angus sires having about a 14% uh, difference in, uh, in the probability of unassisted births. But when we look at birth weight, we're only talking about four pound difference, weaning weight, four pound difference, yearling six. And the dollar value at weaning, uh, these calves for easier calving was worth about $8 more. And so uh, we use calving ease and birth weight as a selection tool, and we can do that without worrying too much about post weaning performance. And we can see that with genetic trend. I think genetic trend is, is pretty interesting today because as we look uh, for this particular breed, and I think this is Red Angus here, is that birth weight uh, was graphed in their uh, data set. It's been relatively flat. But look at, look at what has happened uh, regarding weaning weight, this blue line. Um, since about 76, it's, it's been on an incline, uh, gradually increasing year after year. Look at yearling weight, the amount of growth in yearling weight that we see in these calves uh, today compared to 10 and 20 years ago. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of uh, post-birth growth in calf, uh, not a, lot, a whole lot of negative influence of that growth on the birth weight of those calves. Um, but one thing that, that kind of makes me concerned is that if, if we're getting all of this additional yearling weight out of cattle today, that's going to correspond and translate into additional mature weights, and it's not the height that we were getting back in the 19, uh, late 1980s. Uh, we're talking about depth of body, length of body, width, a lot of capacity in these cattle, uh, a lot of muscling, uh, but still yet, that does come with greater maintenance requirement. And so some concern here is that if we keep getting cattle bigger, that's going to affect our stocking rates in our cow-calf operations. Um, if we don't compensate by reducing cow numbers, we may ultimately start sacrificing body condition to the point that uh, reproduction uh, either declines or we have to spend more money on supplemental feed. So pay attention to the mature size of your cow herd and, and how that translates over into whether or not you need to be selecting a sire that has a greater or more moderate growth characteristics if you're keeping replacement heifers. Now some final thoughts as I wrap up here on selecting bulls. Uh, one concern is uh, as it's associated with many of the breeds looking at efficiency today, efficiency isn't as, as a direct and perfect of a measure as things like weaning weight. There's a lot of error in how we measure feed efficiency. And so we have to be careful when we start putting too much selection f uh, pressure for bulls for greater efficiency. And so a couple of uh, examples of efficiency would be like dollar energy, meaning those that uh, have a better dollar energy value are going to save you more money uh, because of uh, lesser energy requirements. Or it may be the metabolizable energy where they look at the number of uh, megacalories, megacalories needed per cow over a month. What you select for these animals, if you select those for uh, better energy values, you're ultimately selecting for females that are smaller and producing less milk. And so you need to look at your forage base and, and your cow herd and say, do I really need to be selecting for smaller cows that produce less milk? And so be careful with efficiency EPDs. Uh, genomic testing tools, those are available today. We don't have time to get into the genomic testing tools. Uh, but they work well for a group of cattle that you have uh, really no production history on. Uh, the, the genomic tools work very well for highly heritable traits. If you've got production information, you're already measuring those highly heritable traits. And so you don't get as much gain with genomic testing off of cattle that you have a good data set on. Uh, but those that you have uh, very limited information on, the genomic testing can help you maybe identify uh, more productive heifers or lesser productive heifers to go into your cow herd. And then heterosis. Um, we also have to factor in uh, the concept that as we take uh, uh, two animals, uh, a sire that's quite different from our cow herd, that we might uh, be able to benefit from some heterosis as we uh, produce that cross. Heterosis really helps in those poorly heritable traits or lesser heritable traits. Um, things like reproduction and longevity um, that uh, are heritable, but in terms of how we keep cattle, uh, makes it a little bit harder to identify um, with genetic selection. But I tell you what, heterosis, we want to kind of throw that term out there as a, as a way to say we're going to use it as a substitute for good pasture management. And, and that's not what it is. Um, good pasture management is going to help 
your cows stay in good body condition, which is going to translate in maximizing the genetic potential um, of those calves that's related to uh, milk production and growth to the point of weaning. And so heterosis is no substitute for poor environmental management. You've got to do a good job with your pastures. And as a final comment, I think that our genetic trends out of our breed associations are telling us cow-calf guys a really important concept. Look at the differential uh, in these calves in, in weaning weight and yearling weight and how that is spread over time. When do most of us market calves? We're marketing at weaning. Um, I would say that commercial cattlemen are probably giving up a whole lot of money by not retaining ownership of their calves for some point in time. There's a lot of gro post weaning growth potential in these calves and, and basically this line uh, you're giving to somebody else in terms of production. And so when you look at your forage base and the number of cows in your operation, especially as you think about rebuilding your cow herd, is it better to rebuild your cow herd after your drought or as the pastures recovered, keep a smaller cow herd and start re retaining ownership of those calves uh, to capitalize on some of that post weaning growth potential? Is there more income here than with cow expansion? Um, that's a question left for the economist to, to give us an answer on. But something uh, I want to leave you with, and for the past uh, six years, we've always retained ownership as the market suggested with our 300 day grazing calves, and six out of six years that decision was profitable. Well, that concludes my presentation, and uh, I uh, hope that uh, that gave you a little bit of insight on, on EPDs here at the station, how we're using them, and how they might apply to your cow herd.